and support the older town residents who wish to remain in their homes as they age. If we don't currently provide a service, we will try and connect you to that service. Call 311 or 869-6311 to get more information or receive services. Welcome to Project Independence and you. Miller and I will be guest hosting today's um, sh radio show along with Otto Lowe's, who is our regular co-host. How are you doing today, Otto? Good morning, Rebecca. Doing fine. Nice day. Good, good. Yeah, it is a nice day. Um, so today is going to be a great show, another great show pulled together by Christina Liu, the wonderful radio show producer who every week pulls together wonderful guests like the ones that we have today. Um, so today we're going to be speaking with Kathleen Ott and Kathleen, Kathleen is a regional administrator from region two administration for community living. Um, so can you, we'll just start off Kathleen, first of all, welcome and thank you so much for coming on the show today. No, oh, thank you so much, Rebecca and Otto. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. So why don't you just give us a little background? I know that you've been on the radio show before, but the hope is we always have new listeners and um, we just want to get uh, like a little more familiar, the whole background of the administration and, and, and how, how it can be helpful for our seniors. Absolutely. No, I'm pleased to do that because uh, the name of our agency is the Administration for Community Living. And when you hear that, you don't think federal government, but indeed that's what we are. We're the designated federal agency to work with people over the age of 60 and those people with disabilities. We're inspired by, and we uh, administer the Older Americans Act of 1965. And that's really important because that lays the foundation for our local communities and our state governments to provide services to older adults. And back in 1965, whenever um, President Johnson was in office, he had what was called the Great Society Legislation. And the Older Americans Act was part of that because at that time there were no services for older adults. At that time in 1965, they said that the age of 60 is considered to be old age. And I maintain we need to probably take a good look at that now because our life expectancy has actually increased and we have more people living. But why I, I want to say that is that we have a network of aging providers that work and serve older adults. And you might recognize our programs uh, because we fund the states who in turn fund the counties to provide services such as home supports our nutrition program, such as the home delivered meal program uh, and congregate meal sites. Uh, we provide services for the ombudsman program that visit older adults in nursing facilities. We provide funding to senior centers so that they can provide evidence-based programming and main, help in seniors maintain their health and wellness, including social and mental health. So those are some of the programs from the Administration for Community Living and again, uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to share what we do, because if you hear our title, you might not recognize the services. Yeah, what actually, when you use the words community living, uh, what does community living really mean? Well, that's a great question, because we had a merging of the disability community into the aging community in 2011. Before 2011, our administration was called the Administration on Aging, and indeed it still exists uh, as it implements the Older Americans Act. But community living really means choice for older adults. We really have as our mission and as our mantra that we feel older adults have, should have the choice and the option to live in the communities, to be active and productive in their communities, to remain engaged in their communities as they grow older, that they fully participate in their communities so that they're taking part in activities and, and also giving back to the community through volunteer spirit. And that's important because we know that those things keep people vital. So the, to answer your question, Otto, community living really means we want to build services and supports that are available for older adults so that they can remain in the community 
instead of institutionalization. And we've been able to rebalance institutionalization against home and community-based services for the last 20 years. And I'm pleased and proud to say, due to our counties and our state governments throughout the nation, we have a fine network of, of supports to keep people living in the community and participating in the community. I mean, that's, a, you know, kind of what Project Independence is. You know, we started out as a NORC, naturally occurring retirement community over well, well over 10 years ago now in northern New Hyde Park um, as a, an aging in place initiative. And um, from there, we grew to be townwide. So we um, no longer have the NORC. However, we, with Project Independence, modeled our services and programs, you know, af after a NORC, which are really appropriate you know, services for seniors who are, are aging in place. So we really share the same mantra, if you will, um, helping our seniors who, you know, want to stay in their own homes and, and safely, of course. So um, what, what are some of the things that would be interesting to our 60 and over listeners to kind of know what access they might have? And is there a... Um, a financial part to receiving services or becoming part of the program? Well, that's an excellent question because, uh, and I'm, I'm so grateful you asked it because it provides some clarification about what we can offer as an aging network. Indeed, there are services that people can procure such as maybe um, facility um, based care or aging services that you can call and have someone come over and provide uh, perhaps some um, uh, meals, you know, preparing meals and cleaning the house and doing some of that support work that older adults need. But under the Older Americans Act, there are no charges for our programming. People just need to have a need. And so that's what's beautiful about the Older Americans Act, especially our nutrition program. There are funds that are allocated by Congress that come to our agency and then to the state and then again, to the county level to provide services. And the nutrition services is our largest service, but it's not means tested. In other words, you don't have to qualify. But um, again, I think that that's a, a, a very important point because some people can afford services and they can offer the additional services. But under the Older Americans Act, we can provide services such as in-home supports that I make mention of so that people have that choice to remain in the community. Kathleen, when you say your programs, physically, is your agency actually doing it or are you leading into partners who do it like you're like the facilitator, if you will? Exactly. Yes, I would think, Otto, you're right, because we, we basically take the title of funder. We fund the state. They are our stakeholder. The Administration for Community Living receives an allotment from Congress it goes through a formula process. Every state has a state plan where you can go in, anyone can go into NYSOFA, look at the state plan. Every county receives funding from the feds, from the state, and then also their local community to provide these services. So we're the funder. And so, we are, I like to think, the, the foundation for all of the services throughout the nation. So filtering down project independence could be one of the fundees, if exactly. you will. Right. Yes. Okay. yes, indeed. Right. Yes, indeed. We'll have to figure that one out. Like, is <laughs> is there or, or is it grant funded? Like, would it be something that the town would um, apply for a grant and then network with the program? How would the town go about, you know, a, a full and thorough partnership? Well, and that's, that's also very important because they are not able to do that unless it's a discretionary grant. So I'll, I'll make the distinction between the two. The Older Americans Act requires that all of our funding for our core programs go through the state of New York and they in turn work with the counties and the County AAA Association. They receive the funding from the state. There might be a grant such as an evidence-based program. In other words, Project Independence said, you know, we're going to have an, um, an exercise program in the community building. We're going to apply for a grant for evidence-based programming through Administration for Community Living. If they receive that, they have, Project Independence has the opportunity to implement that grant and that activity. So there's a distinction. We have our core programs under the Older Americans Act, and then we have, of course, 
uh, an opportunity for agencies and community-based organizations to apply for these discretionary grants when they come available. So it's important for Project Independence or the town for that matter to be alert to what the grants are. Uh, That's absolutely nobody's right. coming knocking on your door saying, I have a grant for you. Um, people have to be focused on knowing about the grants and then applying for the grants. That's correct. And the way we do that is we encourage all of our community-based organizations to go to grants.gov. They have to uh, apply to be, a, uh, um, I'll use the term very loosely, a member, but they are receiving information and all of the federal grants are posted there. Not only the Administration for Community Living, but all federal grants are posted in that particular website. Where would we start as the town to kind of connect better? Um, is there, is there a, a do we go to the county manager? Is there a yes. state level? Where, where would we begin? Well, let me see. I would always say start local. You know, go to your, your county-based area agency on aging. And I know that they're very familiar with Project Independence. Oh, yes. They are. They are. And, and they could have, but you could go to them and say, we want to do a special project. Uh, I'm going to make something up. Um, we want to, um, uh, th this has actually worked quite well. Communities have gathered older adults to do mystery shopping visits, like going to banks, seeing what the service is like for an older adult. Is there adequate parking? Are they greeted? Uh, are there, uh, their tables low enough so that people can, you know, be seen and, and not, you know, raised up, you know, appropriate height for an older adult. And um, there's some things like that that they could do. So going to the county and saying, we want to try this and we need a little bit of funding to do that, you would probably have a, a, a process to go through. But again, I would certainly do that. Many communities do. Senior centers do that all the time. So I think that's a, that's a start. Would need to be very organized in your thought and your process. You would mm -hmm. need to be able to evaluate it, and you would also be able to measure the outputs. Kathleen, where where do you fit? Like, where's your title? You know, regional administrator. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Where do you fit into the into the picture? Like, what do you do? Certainly. So um, the the nation is divided into what are called regions. And we work for the health, of human, health and human services in Washington, DC. So the Administration for Community Living is under the umbrella of the US Department of Health and Human Services. And we are the designated entity to serve people over the age of 60 under the Older Americans Act. So we have dedicated funding that comes to us from Congress and we disseminate that to state governments. So my stakeholder is New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and Virgin Islands because they are in region two, which is what I represent. Again, all of the states in the United States are under an HHS, Health and Human Services region. And region two happens to be New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and Virgin Islands. And I work with each state uh, official uh, in implementing the Older Americans Act. Well, wow, that's interesting. We actually have to take a short break. We will be back with Kathleen Ott in just a few moments. So I get this call from my grandma and she's like, what's a podcast and how much does it cost? So I tell her podcasts are like radio shows, but you can download them on any device and listen to them anywhere at any time. And they're free. And then she says, I see, but where can you find good ones? And I'm like, go to WCWP.org slash podcast and check out the lineup of original shows or download any podcast app on your phone or tablet and search for LIU studios. And she's all like, oh, that sounds easy. And then she asked me what an app is. LIU Studios Podcasts, available on any podcast app. You know, those little button things on your phone screen. Just ask your grandkids. And welcome back to Project Independence and You here at Senior Talk Radio on WCWP.org, 88.1 FM. Also, you can listen, maybe you are, to the WCWP radio app. And that's just a wonderful app. You download it and you just hit listen and you, you come in live. 
So there's a lot of different ways to access Project Independence in you, um, even on North Hempstead Television. So I'm sure we'll talk more about that with Christina later on in the show. We've been talking with Kathleen Ott, um, learning about the administration for community living and, um, you know, one of, I want to say the hot topics, but, you know, um, a lot of, a lot happened over the pandemic. Certainly, you know, the town project independence had to adjust and move everything virtually um, from exercise to social workers, you know, calling uh, fitness classes on, on, on television, different ways to access. Um, and we really, you know, we really did it. We all kind of became experts. Our, our seniors who did have access to technology were, um, you know, kind of the hand was forced to actually turn the computer on and click on that link. And so it helped a lot. And those that really did not have technology, we um, have, a, have a wonderful government channel and were able to, uh, you know, access the seniors are able to access all the programming that's on North Hempstead television. And of course, with Zoom, as I'm sure you know, you can also call in. So seniors that don't have access to a computer or prefer not to use it and want to take part in engaging in one of our community chats or advisory boards can do so just, just by calling in. So, I mean, you have New York and New Jersey, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and I'm, I'm curious to hear the, the differences between all regions. I mean, probably New Jersey and New York have similar, although we have upstate, which is very different than downstate. Um, and your, your response and kind of what you all learned too during the pandemic and the things that you're gonna be probably carrying over into, into the future. You know, never let a, a disaster go wasted, I think is what we've all said. We have learned so much through this pandemic. And certainly New York and New Jersey, um, especially Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands, they have disasters such as hurricanes and even the earthquakes. But we learned very valuable lessons this time around because it was so catastrophic. For example, overnight, and I literally mean overnight, our nutrition providers flipped the, flipped the switch and all of our congregate meals um, were delivered to the homes. Now that was no easy undertaking. They had to go ahead, figure out uh, distribution routes and so forth and make sure and ensure that older adults received at least one meal a day, which is what we do under the Older Americans Act. And I say that because that was the concern from the onset. We've got to be able to reach these isolated seniors that can't get out to the grocery store and keep them fed during this pandemic. And I'm so proud of the aging network because they certainly didn't miss a beat and in fact, unfortunately, even in New York, we had some of our meal del deliverers, uh, meal drivers uh, actually uh, caught COVID-19 and, and passed away in the service of serving oh. us. So, I mean, there were some significant issues as it relates to the pandemic and the services that we provide. But why that's important, what we've learned is, is that social isolation is really so, it can happen overnight and it exacerbated under the pandemic. And our aging network implemented all kinds of wonderful things, such as what you mentioned, Rebecca, you know, being able to learn how to do the computer, go to the computer and do exercise classes, um, you know, uh, keep people engaged by calling folks on the telephone. There were so many significant efforts to keep people engaged that we really need to celebrate that. And we learned a lot along the way. Uh, New York did an exceptional job because um, they incorporated the robotic pet program. And for those people who were isolated, uh, they got them a robotic pet. And I know people kind of scoff at that and say robotic pet. They do wonders because all of a sudden they're, they're responding to you and it has made a huge difference in New York. In fact, it's a national program that people are emulating all over the United States because New York started it and they've spoken about it and they've measured um, the, uh, the success of that program. And that's just a small example, but it's an important one because we learned a lot through this time. Is the meals delivery program, is that Meals on Wheels? It is. Okay. It is. And again, um, it's it referred to as Meals on Wheels. We call it home delivered meals because that's what it states under the statute. But for your listeners, it's home delivered meals. Um, it's Meals on Wheels. Um, I hear about it all the time. My granddaughter is a social worker with Meals on Wheels. Oh, how 
Awesome. Awesome. And that's our program. That is the meals that are delivered begins with the feds matched with some dollars from the state and the local counties to deliver those services. And it's a wonderful, wonderful way to keep people healthy in their communities. I, I can tell you from the other end of it that it's just not the meals part of it. She's always communicating with the people who get the meals and they look upon her as like a, a social outlet. Um, you know, there's communication all the time, theoretically wrapped around the meals, but there's a whole lot of other stuff that goes on uh, that has nothing to do with food. That's <laughs> right. Food of we the have- mind. Food of the mind. And what we say is that it's more than a meal. And it's that friendly gesture of how are you today? That check, you know, that eyeball uh, observation of how somebody's doing. You know, the people who deliver the meals are volunteers themselves. And they have been a lifesaver to these people who are homebound. So, again, um, it's, it's something that New York did extremely well. In the New York City area, they were serving over one million meals a day. 1 million meals a day. And throughout this nation, every state saw almost a 60% increase in the number of home delivered meals they were providing. So you can see that we had a challenge in getting everything organized and then meeting the increased need, but the aging network responded and kept people healthy and in their homes during this pandemic. You know, it's, it's, Interesting that you have, you know, your with your region, you know, we like with the robotic pets, you know, people are home, they don't, they don't necessarily have to coordinate any kind of effort. Once they get the pet, you know, the pet is there. So those are things that like seniors would have in common throughout, you know, the country, everybody gets a pet, but the different areas, maybe some that are harder to get to, and especially during the pandemic. Um, the different, I, I mean, I'm curious, you know, on Long Island, we're very you know, highly populated. There's access to a lot more volunteers when you go upstate, you know, in the Adirondacks or places that are just so much more complicated to get to. Um, what, what is, what, what are, could you share, like, what are some of the, the differences and the complexities of areas where it is harder to get to seniors when it's so spread out? Well, again, this is an opportunity for me to tout and celebrate New York because they did some amazing things. One of the first things they did, and it underscores what your question is, is that they designated every home delivered meal person as an essential worker. Now, that means that those meal delivery people and the agencies that provide the meal were working hand in hand with the management, uh, the emergency management staff. There was a consistent communication of how people are doing, who's not doing well, and uh, a real respect for the efforts of trying to get a meal to seniors. So that's something that that I think is so very important. Uh, The other thing was Matilda's Law. Something the governor recognized is that our, our programming is built upon volunteers who typically are older. Matilda's Law, and it's not really a law, it was a recommendation, is that older adults find other ways to volunteer instead of going to make a home delivered meal program, perhaps that emergency management staff could actually start delivering meals and the older adults do something else like contact older adults via the telephone. We saw a lot of that. And that really was, uh, that happened in very populated areas. It also happened in rural areas where I think again, the need was much greater because these people are isolated, hard to get to that type of thing. Those again are just two examples of what was a little bit different about New York, but how it affected different parts of our state, the rural areas and the more populated areas in different ways. Could could we go back to the robotic pet thing just for a second? How does somebody go about getting a robotic pet? And is it always a dog, would you say? No. It can be a cat too. Uh, you would go to your local county aging services office and inquire about the robotic pet uh, program. The state of New, uh, again, I have to tell you, the state of New York has talked about this program nationally and you can purchase these robotic pets on Amazon. They're approximately $100 per uh, item. I purchased one for my mother-in-law who was in a nursing facility never really was a cat or a dog person. 
But that little robotic pet gave her such comfort because remember our families couldn't visit nursing facilities. So they could stroke the pet, talk to the pet, the pet responds. But to answer your question, Otto, they come in dogs and cats, different colors. Um, and, and it's truly, it, it, it sounds almost, um, you know, you would think that maybe it's a childish type of intervention, but the fact of the matter is it is really a lifesaver. It helps older people. It helps all of us really when we have a pet, whether it's robotic or not, just to pet and to talk and to have company. Now you can have a pet in a nursing facility? Because I have somebody that I think would be a good candidate. Uh, I'm, <laughs> now I'm going to look at Amazon myself after this. It's, no, it's a hundred bucks. Um, it and it's wonderful. Yes, indeed, you can have the robotic pets in the nursing facilities. Because I know they had therapeutic type dogs that would visit, but that was stopped when COVID started. That's right. They couldn't come in. And uh, I know from visiting people who've been in nursing facilities. Uh, that uh, they really look forward to these dogs visiting them. They're uh, wonderful. Yeah. Oh, well, they're good. And again, I think it's just like our meal program when we say it's more than just a meal. You know, having them visit, having the ability to touch and to hug and to, uh, you know, you have memories that flood back in when you're touching a dog or a cat. Um, you, you have the tactile stimulation. It's something that we all need as human beings. And this pandemic underscored that that human services as compared to health services is just vitally important. And thank goodness we're able to see that in our pandemic response. Great, great information. Um, we do have to take a quick break. We will be back with Project Independence and you, WCWP.org in just a moment. Take WCWP with you wherever you go with the WCWP app. Listen live 24 seven to all of our streams, all from one app. Plus, call the studios directly from the app and visit our social media. Download the app through the iOS App Store on Apple devices or the Google Play Store on Android by searching WCWP Radio or visit WCWP.org for links. The WCWP app, available now on iOS and Android devices. And welcome back to Project Independence and you here at WCWP.org, 88.1 FM on your radio. We've been speaking with um, Kathleen Ott, who is a regional administrator for Region 2, Administration for Community Le Living. So we, we're learning a lot about um, all, all the services and programs and the shifts that happened during the pandemic. But What's on everyone's mind, and I know we don't know, you know, we don't have a looking glass, we can't see the future, but I um, it's like a two-part question. I'm curious to know what programming you foresee continuing. Um, you know, are you also going to be maybe a part three question? Are you gonna do some kind of hybrid? So things that once occurred in person and now you're gonna do, you're gonna continue with the hybrid, maybe on Zoom and in person. Um, and what, you know, I, like, I don't wanna ask you, are you looking at, in the looking glass, but we, we, you know, with the return, you know, potentially um, any day to, you know, what, what, what we can foresee. I mean, I would never say maskless, but, you know, every day where we're getting more and more restrictions lifted that seem to happen so, so suddenly, um, you, you, like it, it almost puts you in a panic mode as a senior provider of services because we went from thinking, okay, you know what, we're never going to get any of our summer programming done because we're not going to be in person. So let's continue with our technology. And then all of a sudden, it's things are opening. Within a week, everything was opening. More people can be in a place at one time. Um, social distancing and mask wearing becomes a recommendation, except for public travel and healthcare. So, what what kind? I mean, did did that put you all? I want to say in a panic mode, but okay, it's here before we really were able to implement, you know, the return. So there's a lot of kind of questions there, but it's you know re really coming back to what you foresee after pandemic, or you know, they're kind of coming back from the pandemic. Well, yes, you're right because what what we can't lose sight of is what we've learned from this. You know, what is the value? The, well, there's so many things we could point to. 
again, social isolation. We knew it was a challenge and a problem before the pandemic, but it, it was exacerbated like I made mention of. Depression, substance abuse, um, and also suicide rates, you know, all of them skyrocketed. We need to be able to get back to that new normal where we recognize that we have to take care of ourselves. I had, when I was a state director in, for the state of New, New Hampshire, and one of my favorite uh, ladies that was an older adult there, she said, everybody needs to recognize we're all seniors in training. And I always refer to that because it's so true. And that means exercising. It means staying socially engaged. It means giving back to the community. And that's one of those lessons learned. We've got to get back to that now that we can. And I would re really be remiss if I didn't say we really need to encourage all of our older adults to get the vaccination if they feel comfortable with it. It will open your world back up to that new normal a little faster. Senior centers throughout the nation are beginning to open up and it's a new day there. You know, they have new policies and guidelines and so forth. But we can, we can acclimate because we know it's the right thing to do. I think that the new normal for us will be a greater appreciation for the human services, helping people get meals and groceries and uh, supports in the home and visiting people in nursing facilities because they're lonely. We're gonna go back to some of those basic human service needs that quite this country used to do before we had an aging network. Before we had home delivered meals, we had a neighbor that was checking on Mrs. Smith I think we're going to be going back to some of that. And I hope that we can retain the opportunity to continue that because it's so vital. I would also say that um, livable communities is so important. Recognizing the value of community, what's offered in your community, taking advantage of what's offered in your community. And if it's not there, creating that environment, the evidence-based programming to help people stay engaged. It's those opportunities that we cannot let pass uh, without really recognizing it. So I'll bundle it up by saying, I think human services came to the rescue this time around. Uh, usually it's a health response, but human services were the real heroes here. And I think we just need to continue to say, Aging Network, you're doing a great job. We're gonna continue to support you and we wanna help us raise our own bar. And I think we can do it. Uh, yeah. I agree. I My belief, and I'm going looking back in life, is that uh, as a society, we got fairly soft and uh, comfortable and not appreciate things that uh, were taken for granted, like you described. Uh, people who stock shelves, people who move the carts out of the way in the parking lot, uh, whatever. And, and uh, I believe some parts of our society look down on those types of things. And uh, I believe that sometimes out of adversity comes strength. And um, I, I think in a long haul, we will all be better off. Um, somebody will toughen up a little bit. And uh, I think we could stand that at one point. And this has put us through it, whether we like the idea or not. You know, it seems like the hardest senior population to reach are your homebound seniors, you know, frail, elderly, living at home, maybe no family around, um, or, or, or by choice, you know, they're homebound, they don't leave. So actually, you know, what happened during the pandemic was every senior, everybody essentially became homebound. So I think it's, it's you know, we learned a lot about what a daily life of somebody who were, it's so hard to you know, find homebound seniors because, you know, even, even neighbors aren't engaging with them because they, they feel like, you know what, you know, Mrs. Smith just doesn't want to be bothered and, you know, that whole kind of a thing. So by having all of our seniors, you know, essentially homebound for a year, um, maybe longer, you know, hopefully we learned more about, you know, that lifestyle because it is a lifestyle. I mean, people who are homebound and have been for years have to have their services in place or people shopping for them or, or that kind of a thing. So, you know, maybe there, you know, that, that would be, you know, kind of an interesting aspect to look at what we did learn about people who are homebound and, and, you know, maybe that would help us, you know, access those people or, 
I, I don't know, do, you know, some kind of study, something. You know, we, I, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, well, we just went through a real life experience in my own home. Um, my wife tore three, had three muscle tears in her no. shoulder and two in the other. One was a rotator cuff and uh, she had pain and it went on for, I'd say, several months. Um, and what we learned was, first of all, if you can't raise your arms and you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't get dressed, you can't feed yourself, there's a lot of things you can't do. And we must have said a thousand times, what do people do who have nobody that are in situations like that? We happen to have the good fortune of three daughters who live nearby, and a daughter is a daughter, and a son is a son. Uh, you know, but we have three daughters and a granddaughter who's the social worker with Meals on Wheels, all who live nearby. So we were not lacking for support. Um, but it made us think again about how many people do not have that luxury. They don't have anybody near them. And this was not like life threatening. It was life altering um, mm -hmm. for a while. And then finally, a cortisone shot has helped, uh, yeah. you know, take the pain yeah. out of it. But, uh, you know, when you get it like you have both parts here, the disabled and the senior part of it, no matter how old you are, if you get into a category where you can't function for yourself, you need help. And how do you get it if you're all alone? Yeah. You know, Otto, that's a perfect example, and, and I'll, I'll be somewhat brief, but I think you just ex described what I think is really important and a great takeaway. Resilience, you know, finding that resilience within each individual to take responsibility for themselves when they can, and to recognize what they can do, what they can do for others, and what they can do for themselves. The second piece of that is to say, I need help. I need a little bit of help. I don't know where to go. So you call your county agency on aging, area agency on aging, but you ask for help and it's out there. You just have to be able to say, I need. It. And then the third thing is it teaches us a lesson for preparedness that we want to make sure to be uh, valuable older adults and want to remain independent, that we prepare for what we think we can prepare for, such as those grab and go bags. Um, you know, if there's a disaster, you have water, you have three days worth of food. You have those things to take care of yourself. So the resiliency, that ability to ask for help when you need it, and then also that preparedness feature are exactly what I think our older adults need to do. And I would say, Otto, you're very blessed to have as part of your preparedness package, your three daughters, because I know that they've really come to the rescue, I'm sure, as they would in any family. It's really important. True. No doubt about that. It pays to have a good relationship with your family. <laughs> That's another lesson to be learned. That's number four. Yes. <laughs> right, right. It really, it really is. I mean, uh, Otto does have a very supportive, supportive family. And, um, you know, it's wonderful to hear about it. But it does make you, you know, wonder, you know, about people who, who don't have that. And, and you know, it's, it's, such, it's so complicated. Um, you know, aging in itself, becoming, you know, becoming frail and um, maybe being alone, being widowed. But having this kind of network in your toolbox and understanding all, also more importantly is how to access it because there are some incredible services on Long Island. With Project Independence, I always tout this. We have the 311 call center. If you're a town resident, you call 311 and you are connected to any department in the town, whether you have, there's a pothole you're reporting or you're looking for transportation or you want to speak with a project independent social worker, community nurse, you know, that 311 is that one call. And then that call goes to our department. So everything that project Ind independence does, it's just, it just comes to our department and we then we then send it out to the appropriate region because we too broke the town up into regions and that particular person, if they're in New Hyde Park are assigned the social worker in New Hyde Park, will call them back. So all these terrific programs on Long Island and there's so many, it's just, it's, you have to, they're all in like silos to access which makes it hard for seniors. So, you know, um, 
I wish there was like one senior phone number you could call in like New York State and say, what's in my town or what can I do or what's there the is. best service? Is there? There is. And that's New York Connects. If uh, you're familiar with um, aging, yeah. what are called aging and disability resource centers, every state has a system. New York has New York Connects. Um, I wished I had the 800 phone number, but they will connect you to local resources in your community. There's also on ACL's website, the Elder Care Locator, which does the exact same thing. It connects people to their local resources. And so those are two important uh, opportunities uh, for people to find out and see what's local. I would also underscore something you made mention of Rebecca, and that's the value of family. They're the trusted resources that can support an older adult locate those resources. When we come back from a break, we'll talk. We'll talk about that because I bet you that Christina has that eight, that eight hundred connect number ready to go. So we'll be back after a quick break. WCWP is your home for great music and great conversation. You'll find all that and more on WCWP.org. Listen live on the web. Check out the lineup. Subscribe to podcasts. And stay up to date on the latest station events. Get in touch with us and let us know if you like what you're hearing. And find out how you can support or get involved at the only community public radio station serving Nassau's North Shore. Plus, sign up to get a free bumper sticker. It's all online at WCWP.org. And welcome back to Project Independence. And you here at Senior Talk Radio. I'm Rebecca Miller. I'm your guest host for today's show, along with Otto Lowe, who is the co-host. Otto, what a great show, a lot of information. Well, we're dealing with somebody who really knows what they're talking about, so that makes it easy. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. It's great. Um, and Christina Liu, who, of course, is the radio show producer and also the director of Senior Citizen Affairs for Project Independence. Um, so I know, Otto, you had a lot of questions, and we were talking about family after break. If there was anything else you wanted to continue well, with, Kathleen? Yeah, I believe that uh, Project Independence has a very, very valuable tool, which we kind of underplay and don't uh, promote uh, as much as maybe I think we should. Uh, the circle of support. I think I have used it with people who I know who are by themselves, and what it did do was make them, it forced them to think a little bit about what is going to happen if something happens, you know, or even if it doesn't happen, maybe I just have a muscle tear in my shoulder, like I described, uh, who do I contact, you know, who, who should, what are my connections in life? And this is five pages of information. Um, you know, there's little things like I need a hearing aid to hear. Maybe that ought to be documented. Uh, you know, you go into a hospital or a nursing home and people don't know that. And they just keep talking and you don't have any idea what they're talking about. Uh, you know, being one who has a hearing issue, uh, when I don't wear my hearing aids, it's hard to hear. That's why I wear a hearing aid. <laughs> uh, you know, and there's a lot of things like people have, uh, maybe they don't have their own teeth. <laughs> you know, you have to tell people this or they're not, nobody's a mind reader. So the point is the circle of support can include all these kinds of personal needs as well as uh, who your contact should be, your religious beliefs or non-beliefs, whatever. Uh, anyhow, that's, I believe that's a very powerful tool. And uh, circle, circle of Support is completed by nurses and social workers from Project Independence with people. And I think it's a very valuable service. You know, Otto, you, you raised something that's so important. And just to underscore what you made mention of, is that people need to feel comfortable completing the circle of support because it will really be helpful. All of us like to think it won't happen to us, but a disaster or emergency could happen at any point in time. And it is so helpful for family members to have this information. So I, I encourage all of the listeners to take advantage as you've made mention, because it really is very, very important uh, during a disaster or an emergency situation to have that ready to go. And, you know, it's really interesting. I haven't thought about it in a while. We haven't talked about it. But where the circle of support started, so when, almost when we expanded to the first region outside of the North, it kind of came in this great, great neck plaza where there was a man, an older man who recently widowed, was very, very active and never left his apartment. 
he just stopped. He got very depressed. It was a, it was, you know, an unfortunate scenario, but probably common, um, had to give up his keys, couldn't do anything for himself, lost weight, got depressed. And, um, a neighbor just knocked on his door and said, you know, I'm going to the supermarket. Do you need anything? And, and he really kind of didn't, um, do anything like that. Ne oh, it's the generation where you never ask for help because it's looked at as a weakness. And um, he was at that point was really a year down in this depression. And he just said, you know, yeah, that would be great. And and then from there, he said, you know, this is wonderful. And, and he's like, you know, um, I know that someone else in the apartment will go to the cleaners or do all this kind of stuff. So he learned how to kind of ask for help because he realized people want to help. Right. And, and it got to the point where he had to turn people away. He's like, no, my, my fridge is full. You know, I have all my laundry and it, and it just kind of, you know, you have to be your own advocate. So the circle of support is your personal advocate tool. And it's important. Like what, Otto was saying to work with a project independent social worker and nurse to kind of compose it. But it's also important for you when you hear someone say, hey, you know, I can run to the store for you at any time, jot that down in there too. And say, hey, you know, and people do love to help. I mean, nine out of 10 times, you know, a lot, you, people are happy to go. I mean, I'm, 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 I still, I'm still shopping for the pandemic for my uncle. He just, he likes it. You know, we, we get to talk a lot more. We see each other more. Um, you know, he sometimes will buy me food. So that's savings for me, you know, it's, it's beneficial for both. <laughs> I love, I love what Otto shared about the hearing loss, because I will tell you having worked in aging services my entire life, um, we can actually interpret hearing loss to be dementia. If somebody is not responding back appropriately, sometimes people can misinterpret that, that, oh, he's confused. And then the pride takes in and you don't want to admit that you have a hearing deficit, but the other person is thinking, my goodness, that man is starting to, or woman is starting to um, uh, be, you know, be confused. That's where assistive technology comes in. You know, being able, as you make mention, Rebecca, to own it, to ask for some help, and then to get the resources available. And, you know, it sounds like Project Independence is with a 311 call, people can call and say, where can I get um, uh, assistive devices, such as a pocket talker that is a basically just a little headset that people can wear, wear and all of a sudden they can hear. Um, you could also call the New York Connects that I made mention of for assistive technology information to help and support people with their needs. I think we have that phone number now that Christina looked up for us. So New York Connect, any resident in New York can call and get a lot of information on resources that are out there in your, in your local community. So that was 800-342-9871. You know, um, and you can, you can also call 311 to get that phone number at any time, so. Assistive technology is a huge, huge category. Uh, you know, like I, I looked into it a little bit because of this shoulder business mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, you can't lift your arm. Okay. They have these gadgets that you can use to get something off the higher shelves and whatnot. A small example, um, people with macular degeneration, it's a terrible thing. Um, all of a sudden you can't read, you can't watch television. There's a lot of things you can't do, uh, which we, none of us like to lose that capability, but there are devices that can help those situations. And I think what's really required is somebody who's just not trying to sell you something, but somebody who really does know what they're talking about. Uh, and that's, that's a, if there are people out there who have that knowledge and that ability, I encourage you to volunteer for somebody and transfer that knowledge because there's a lot of people who could use it, you know, in terms of what can you use and without me worrying about you trying to sell me the best medical alert system or the best whatever, um, you know, an honest somebody who can tell you what you can use for your problem, whatever the circumstance. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a knowledge I don't have. I have scattered and not enough. <laughs> well, and that's where those trusted sources come in. You know, they can help with that decision making. You know, you can confer with your daughter, your son, or neighbor who you trust 
to help you make good decisions if indeed you, you think something's just not quite right or you're feeling that push to buy something. Uh, bring in another party to help you make that decision. I know I do, and uh, and it helps. It helps. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's just so much out there. You know, there's, there's, there's so much out there. And um, for um, people that are listening, if you want more information on um, the administration for community living, you can also call 311. And um, we have a host of information and can connect you to them um, through, you know, through our staff. Um, one of the things that is interesting too, a big part of living on Long Island is transportation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a large uh, federal grant, the 5310 um, for seniors and people with disabilities that we've had for many, many years now. So I think we're in our fourth three-year cycle um, and we use taxis. So we do a public procurement and we, um, have three taxi companies that are designated to our little regions and people call 311. You know, we are also an incredibly resource rich township. We have Northwell, Winthrop, St. Francis, major healthcare system. So a lot of, if you know, not 90% of doctors will have their practices around too. So we do offer medical transportation within the town limits. Um, during COVID, we offered transportation to get vaccines. Um, you know, it was a, a, a huge, a, a huge undertaking because we had to kind of expand and we were working with, you know, our New York State DOT um, contract manager and, and also our grants manager to kind of expand and see where we can, you know, provide transportation. We also do free food shopping. During COVID, our taxi transportation program went completely cashless. Um, riders were, would be the only, they solo traveled. So there was no one else in the car. You know, we did everything we could. We expanded hours, especially for senior food shopping because a lot of the markets opened up at 6 a.m. And, and allowed seniors to be the only shoppers for that particular hour. So, you know, we learned so much during, during that time period. And um, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but in terms of transportation and, and, and programs like that, you know, especially in communities where, you know, even upstate, I mean, it's such a, you know, again, another complex scenario for, for seniors. What, what types of programs are available if there are? Well, a Project Independence seems to have really done a great job at focusing on how they can uh, really streamline the services and make them appropriate for older adults. Uh, you know, under Title Three B of the Older Americans Act, there are funding, there are funds available for transportation, but I would tell you they're not enough funds. You know, it, it's it, uh, that's the challenge. Uh, the Older Americans Act funding doesn't really meet all of the need. That's why the state dollars are very important as well as the county dollars. Putting them together does help. So we do have that option under Title 3B of the Older Americans Act to use those for uh, transportation services. I always say, and if you ever look at, um, as you know, every 10 years or so, there is a, a meeting at the White House where we talk about the needs of older adults. The top two are always transportation and housing. And if I think yes. I could ever solve those two, it would be like solving world peace because um, it, it's just so big, so broad, so challenging, and it's different in, in, in every community. But what you've just described, Rebecca, is just really, I would say, a best practice or a promising practice for other communities. It sounds as if Project Independence has really done a great job of evaluating, assessing, and then implementing programs so I, I would tell you, I think you're probably ahead of the game there. Right, right. And I wanted to add another major thing that has to be looked at is snow shoveling. I mean, uh, it is, it, 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 no, I don't want to say it's a bone of contention, but because, you know, we can't plan it. It could happen in the middle of the night. Um, it is a private kind of property issue for seniors. Um, so anyway, I just would, wanted to throw that in there. We don't have much time. I know that we'll have you back. So much appreciate all this vital information.